So open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 21. If you remember, this is what we studied last week. We're going to get the entire section this time. I want to remind you that Matthew 5, 20, right before this, Jesus said something startling. He said in his sermon to his disciples and all who are listening, Unless you are more righteous than the most righteous people you can possibly think of. Right? They had a picture of godliness, and it was the scribes and the Pharisees. And he said, unless you're more righteous than the godliest people that you can think of, the ones who keep the law down to the very letter, they thought, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus goes on to show that every single one of us is condemned under the law. That the standard of righteousness that God has for us is higher than you and I could ever keep. It's not enough to just not murder. You can't even be angry with your brother. According to that standard... Every single person in this room and every single person that Jesus was talking to was instantly condemned. Instantly. And that's why we sing the songs we just sang. Our only hope to be righteous before God is to have somebody else's righteousness given to us. Jesus's. And that's the story. That's the good news that we sang. And God doesn't only forgive us in the gospel, say, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll give you Jesus's righteousness. He doesn't only forgive us, but then he changes us when you're saved from the heart so that you can actually begin to live up to this righteous standard that exceeds anything that the scribes and the Pharisees even began to imagine. So we learned last week, uh, and this is our first point, we learned last week that God's children aren't angry, even from the heart. God's children aren't angry. Jesus said, and I'm just going to read the, the verse to you right now. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the Sanhedrin, to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. The reason why the murderer, which I can't think of any sin that's worse than murder. The murderer and the angry person in the same category before God because the root of murder is anger. Anger is murderous in principle. And when I see that, I don't know about you, you ought to say, I need a savior. Because as soon as Jesus says that, nobody here can say, I feel pretty good about myself. I think my good deeds will outweigh my bad. Maybe if I'm religious enough, if I try hard enough, maybe I can get to heaven. Maybe God will let me in. Or you can't look at your friend at school or your family member and say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy, so I must be all right. Because according to God's righteous standard, if you've been angry with your brother, or sister, if you've said you're a fool, 
if you've rolled your eyes at your parents, if you've been angry, you're guilty. So do you know what we want? We don't want to go to God and say, God, give me what I deserve. Who wants that? Who wants to say, God, give me what I deserve? I think I'll be all right. Because you know what? Imagine a, a murderer. And he's sitting in the courtroom. And they play the tape. He didn't know, but his crime was caught on tape. There was a video on there. It caught everything, and they play it. The judge, the jury, they all see it is undeniable. You did it. And the verdict is going to come down. You don't have any room to say, it wasn't me. Yeah, but you were caught red-handed. The evidence is there. And do you know what? The anger in your heart that maybe only you saw, nobody else knows about. The omniscient, that means all-knowing God of the universe who saw down into, the, sees down into the deepest you, knows you better than you know yourself, sees that. And it makes you as guilty as the murderer with the tape playing before the judge and the jury. But this gospel that we just sang about, Colossians 2.14 says that God has canceled for all who have faith the certificate of debt. He took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. It's as if God took that security tape that condemns you, he punished Jesus for the sin, and he put a nail right through the tape. It's gone. It's done. You cannot be condemned. If you come to God in faith, saying, God, don't give me what I deserve. And this is why anger is so bad. When you're angry, what are you saying to the person you're angry to, about the person you're angry to? You're saying, I want you to have what you deserve. You deserve my anger. You deserve my wrath. And you replay the story over and over and over again. You're holding that person to a standard that you yourself do not want to be held to before God. God doesn't rehearse your sin, Christian. Do you know what it says in Isaiah 43, 25? Listen to this. Listen to this. This is amazing. This is God describing himself. When, you, when the Bible, when God says, this is who I am, this is like when you star this, you underline it, you say, I need to know that. This is Isaiah 43, 25. God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake. I will not remember your sins. Hebrews 8.12, we heard that this morning. I don't know if you remember it, but it was quoting Jeremiah 31.34. God says to believing Israel, he says, I will remember their sins no more. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus fulfilled the law, suffered our punishment, and gives us his righteousness. To all who would believe, Everyone in this room, what I just talked about, God not remembering your sins, that only applies to some here. I guarantee you there are some hearing my voice where the wrath of God, the anger of God still is on you. And what we're going to hear today, we're going to finish this lesson with something that helps you know Am I a believer? Do I have faith? Has God taken my debt of my the record of my sin, nailed it to the cross, putting it on Jesus? Do I have Christ's righteousness? This passage will actually help us determine 
if that applies to you. If you are a Christian, if you truly believe that you have been forgiven all that debt, that God's anger no longer is on you, but he's, he's treated you with mercy and not judgment, you will be quick and you will want to cover over others' sins against you. That's why the standard of righteousness that God has is that you wouldn't be angry with your brother. That's why you love your brother. And that's why the first point, this is just reviewing what we did last week, God's children aren't angry. Rather, God's children are loving. And so Jesus says in Matthew 5, let me just read this. He says, if you are angry with your brother, you'll be liable to judgment, right? And if you say you're, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. And then he says, therefore. And we've been learning about how to study the Bible. When you see the word therefore, or the word so, pay super close attention because the author is trying to help you understand something that's true. And so without looking down, without seeing what Jesus teaches next, so no fair cheating, if you, if you were in the audience and you heard Jesus say, if you're angry with your brother, you'll be liable to judgment. If you say you fool, you'll be liable to hell. Therefore, just think, what would you think? think he's going to say next? I would think he'd say, therefore, uh, confess your anger to your brother. Therefore, don't be angry. Therefore, um, if you're angry with your brother, stop it. Therefore, and, and he would continue to address you, the angry person. And I I have to be, be honest, This what comes after the therefore sort of messed me up. I actually wanted to preach this whole section last week, and I couldn't figure it out. I was sitting there looking at the therefore, and I couldn't figure out what it was there for. That's the question you want to ask every time you see that word. So, therefore, understand the argument. And I, just, I might be the only one here, but I couldn't get it. I'm like, this doesn't make sense, Jesus. Why are you saying what comes after? I don't see the connection. Let's read it. I, I want to see if you can see the connection. Jesus says, if you're angry with your brother, you're liable to judgment. If you say, you fool, you're liable to the hell of fire. Therefore, or so, if you're offering a gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, Go first and be reconciled. You see the difference? He changed, he changed what he's talking about. He was just talking to the angry one. If you're angry with your brother, that's a problem. You gotta, you're guilty. You're, you're liable to hell. So, if your brother has something against you, he totally changed who he's talking about. What does he say? If your brother... If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, go first and be reconciled to him. I've read this verse so many times in my life and I just skipped past that therefore. And you know what? This is the sweet thing about Bible say. When you ask questions, when you keep looking at your fish, you're like, I, I need to understand what this is saying. It opens up for you, the, the author's intent, it opens up the meaning. The connection is love. When you are angry, you're not acting in mercy, you're not acting in love. And if you realize, let's, let's unpack this together, and let's read these verses and see if you see it. I'm going to read 23 and 24. Can you skip to that so it's up on the, on the screen? 
So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you. Notice Jesus doesn't say anything of whether it's right or wrong, whether you're guilty or not. Maybe you did something to him, maybe not. Maybe he's mad at you for no reason. Jesus didn't expound it. But if you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Let's, let's unpack that together. Let's figure out what's going on. I, I want to tell you that the big picture here is not only are God's children not angry, we learn God's children seek reconciliation. But what's, what's in Jesus' mind here? Well, I think it's, what did we just learn? If, my, if I have anger, I'm liable. If my brother has anger, what's going on in his heart? If he has something against me and he's angry, his anger makes him liable to judgment. Even hell. If I love my brother, what am I going to go do? I'm going to go on a rescue mission. And it makes it all that much worse that my brother's angry at me. Maybe I sinned against him. If I did, oh, I need to humble myself and seek forgiveness. But even if I didn't, even if there's nothing in me that I can see, I need to do the same thing. I need to go to my brother, humble myself instead of judging, and seek reconciliation. You see, Jesus just upped the standard even one more step. The mark of love is don't be angry with your brother. And, and we, as we reviewed last time, that's the second greatest command. First is love the Lord your God, right? And the second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is describing what loving your neighbor as yourself is. Don't be angry at them. Don't say you fool. And if they're angry with you, go make it right. Go reconcile. That's what you'd want them to do for you, right? If you were in danger, if you were in danger of, if you were sinning against God and thought you were justified, you'd want your brother to go help you. Go. So if my brother has something against me, I know that he's in a dangerous place in regards to anger. If I've sinned against him, I need to go humble myself and confess it. And even if I didn't, I need to go to him. Do you see how that therefore of verse 23 reveals what Jesus is getting at? It's not just two separate commands. Don't be angry and go be reconciled. There's a, there's a logical connection there. Jesus moves from addressing your and my anger, and then he surprises us. He moves to address anger of people provoked by me and you, even if you're not responsible for it. So what's going on here? Like, what's actually going on here? Because we don't have gifts and altars. I don't, we don't, this isn't for us, right? This was spoken to a Jewish audience. Remember, that's one of the things that we talked about we have to do. Before we can apply it to us, we got to go figure out what the original author meant for the original audience. Jesus is on the mountain speaking to Jews. And for the Jew to go to the temple, the temple is where the altar was. And they brought an animal to sacrifice as an act of worship. It's an act of faith. It would be what Jewish worshipers would do to go to God and confess their sins. It was actually an agreement with God to say, I am sinful and I'm separated from you and need to be cleansed before you. God, you are worthy of my sacrifice. You are worthy of my worship. He doesn't specify whether this is a, a sin sacrifice or one of the other offerings named in, in the law, but whatever it was, Jesus is saying, if you're doing even the very best thing that you could ever think of doing, which is worshiping God, right? This is the right thing for the Jew, for the God-fearing Jew, for the child of God to do. Uh, 
to be actually going to the altar. So he's at the altar with a gift, with an offering. That's the best thing. Jesus is saying, even if you're doing the absolute best thing you can think of to do, the most truly godly thing, and then you realize, my brother has something against me. There's something more important at that moment than you, that you need to do than make the sacrifice, than give God the gift. It's to go and be reconciled to your brother. Right? It was good and right for the Jew to sacrifice and worship. It actually would have been disobedience not to do that. For the Jew, for the people listening, it would have been disobedience to just say, oh, I don't need to go to the altar ever. I'm just going to live my life and not do this. It was an act of love. It was an act of worship. It was an act of faith to do that. But listen to me here, because this is where we apply. Remember, we understand the principle, what it meant to the original audience, and then we move it to our time and apply it. Observation, interpretation, application. Here's Here's how this can apply this. Here's the principle. Outward acts of obedience, even worship, must come from a pure heart. Cannot come from a hypocritical heart. Jesus teaches that reconciliation with others is so important that it should interrupt the most important act of worship that he could come up with. So think about what you do. Think about, about your acts of worship, the good things that you do. Reading the Bible, coming to church, what we just did, worship, singing, serving the body, taking communion, listening to sermons, serving your neighbor. These are all really, really important things that if you are a Christian here, you should do. If you don't do those things, you're disobeying. But if you are doing those things and realize that you have unconfessed sin in your heart or some way that you are acting in an unloving manner at that moment towards your neighbor, go make it right. Don't be content to say, I'll deal with that later. It's not that important. I'll deal with that later. I'm doing the God worship thing now. No, there's something more important at that moment than worshiping God while your heart, while you have sin or lack of love going on in your heart. And it would be truly unloving if your brother is in danger, if your brother's angry at you, to just leave him in his anger. Go to him. Do you know what would be even better? Uh, if you were to fix this before you got to the altar, right? Like, don't be like, oh, I'm about to sing. I better think. Am, is everything okay? Do I, have, do I have broken relationships with people? Do I have unconfessed sin? You know what? If you're sitting there and, and something like that comes to mind and you can do something about it in that moment, go. It's more important for you to go make it right than to sing, than to listen to the sermon. But if you can do something in that moment. But it's even better if you just make a habit of doing this in your daily life. Saturday night before church on Sunday. Uh, how am I, am I being a hypocrite? Am I loving my neighbor? Are there, am I angry in my heart? Did I offend somebody? Is there something I can do to reconcile a relationship? The important thing here is do not be a hypocrite. This situation sort of reminds me of God's words to King Samuel in first or King Saul in 1 Samuel 15. I, I don't know if you guys remember the story, if you've read through through 1 Samuel. It's sort of the, the beginning of the of the really big fall of, of Saul. It's it's when Saul God took the kingdom away from Saul. So God had told Saul, this was a command for Saul, the king of Israel. He said, go wipe out the Amalekites. Obey me, wipe out the Amalekites. God had been patient with the Amalekites for hundreds of years. 
And he wanted Israel to be his instrument of judgment on them. Wipe them out. Don't leave anything. And Saul says, okay. And God gave them success. He went in, conquered them completely. God said, destroy everything. Destroy everything. Saul decided that there's some really good stuff here. We should probably keep it because it would be a shame to destroy it. Um, and he said, it'll be okay because we'll offer some of it as an offering to God. Right? Disobedient from the heart. Not obeying God all the way. Not obeying God completely. But it's okay because I'll still do my outward act of worship. I'll, we'll keep some of the good stuff and we'll sacrifice some of the best sheep. And Samuel, the prophet, comes to him, and Saul says, yep, uh, I've obeyed. I've obeyed. Samuel points out that all the sheep aren't dead. Um, and says, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. We don't sacrifice by killing animals anymore. Jesus did that once and for all at the cross. But it is right for us to do acts of worship, to go through, to, to do things like read the Bible, to sing, to love, to, to do the, the ministries of the church to even present our bodies as a living sacrifice. But if you do that while not obeying and being content to not obey, that's not a sacrifice. That's not the kind of worship that the Lord will be pleased with. God loves your acts of worship, right? This singing, it, uh, Chris said it's like a, a pleasing aroma. When God hears, if you are worshiping him from the heart, he is glorified through our singing. But what if you were the best singer and you were singing loud and it looked like you were worshiping God and there was unconfessed sin in your heart? Would that kind of singing, would that kind of worship honor the Lord? What if I'm up here preaching? I'm, I'm teaching God's word and it sounds really good. And there's unconfessed sin in my life. That kind of teaching glorify God? No. To obey is better than sacrifice. And if I'm not loving my brother, even in, in letting there be broken relationship, that I'm okay to just leave broken. I'm not loving my brother. I need to drop what I'm doing. And go. What does he say? Go back to the, the verse uh, from Matthew. Jesus says, first, go. Leave, leave your gift. First, be reconciled to your brother. Uh, there's an urgency to making things right. There's an urgency to making things right. And that is what genuine love is. Paul in Romans 12, just listen, you don't have to turn there. He speaks of genuine love. And we're called to genuine love. That's the way, that is the mark of a Christian. If you are a Christian, if you say, oh, I don't want God's wrath, I want God's mercy. God showed his love for you and you will be marked by love. That is what faith, that's, what, what hap that's how you see faith. And he says, let, gen let there be genuine love. And the way that that plays itself out, Paul says, is that if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So I want you to think, are there people in your life that you're mad at? You just have an angry relationship. There's just discord and bitterness. Or maybe there's somebody in your life right now that you know is mad at you. I want you to ask yourself, have you done everything? 
as far as it depends on you to live at peace with that person. It's a high standard. Jesus has a really high standard, but he doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't done for us. Think of what he did. What did he do to be at peace with us? We were his enemies, right? We hated God from the heart. God had, just as God the Father, had righteous wrath, righteous anger stored up. And, and it was like the, the illustration that Smed gave this morning where you have Mentos and Diet Coke. You put them together, it was not going to go well. Jesus put himself between us and God the Father, absorbed all of his wrath. As far as it depends on you, you'll never, I'll never even come close to humbling myself and inconveniencing myself and taking on suffering is like Jesus did for me. So there's four commands here. Leave. That reveals the initiate that reveals the priority of reconciliation. Whatever you're doing, even the most important thing, leave it. Reconciliation is more important. Reconciliation just means being at peace together. And he says, go. Uh, Christian love requires initiative. It's not like, I'll just wait here. I'm ready to talk if he is. Go. Be reconciled. Saving your brother from danger of anger, right? Your brother's in danger. And making sure that you're not participating in sin is critical. And then offer your gift. It doesn't say never come back. Come back, worship. Read the Bible. Do your acts of worship. The, the believer should have then come back to the temple. Uh, then come and offer your gift. Make things right and then come back. But if you don't know, and this is the next point, that godless discord has consequences. You know what discord means? It's just a, it's, it, when the relationship is broken, or my brother has something against me, I'm angry at him. There's consequences to that. Jesus goes on to point out that if you and I don't go and seek reconciliation, if we don't go and seek peace, there will be eternal consequences for the one who is angry, right? Because it, that if you're angry, you're liable to judgment. And if my brother's angry at me, there's going to be eternal consequences for him because harbored bitterness and anger isn't consistent with a Christian life. You're actually revealing what you believe. But what about me? If I say, oh, that's fine. God will have his, just, his justice out on that guy. He deserves it for being so mad at me. No, Jesus says there's actual consequences for you if you leave your brother in your anger, in his anger. Let's read it. There's earthly consequences, not just eternal ones for unresolved conflict. Verse 25, Jesus says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you've paid the last penny. What is Jesus talking about? Think about it for a second. See if you can figure it out. What is Jesus talking about? Well, if you know your brother has something against you, he's angry. Anger and unresolved conflict escalates. Remember, the heart of anger is the same heart that murders. Most of us don't actually murder the people we're mad at, not because we're incapable of murder from the heart, but because if you murder, you're going to get in trouble, <laughs> right? Or maybe you're not powerful enough to murder. Like you're scared of the consequences, or you just don't have a weapon uh, handy. But the same heart, Jesus tells us the truth, the same heart that's angry will escalate into murder. But we do some things, the earth, the world does some things less than that. They would say, I'm angry at you. I'm going to build a case against you. 
True or false, it doesn't matter. You're so angry, you're going to say, I'm going to get justice. And in this world, what do we do when we say, I'm going to get justice out of that person? You sue them. Uh, the Bible says Christians don't sue each other. <laughs> That's for another day. The Bible's very clear. Christians don't sue each other. But this is why. Because suing somebody is saying, give me justice. Christians don't say, I demand justice. Because we would never say, God, give me what I deserve. You say, Jesus got what I deserve. God gave me mercy. I'm going to give mercy. But if your brother's angry at you and you don't go and make it right with him, it's going to escalate. He's taking you to court. And if it's getting to that point, if, if you missed your opportunity at the altar, go to him then. Say, no, please, let's not do this. Let's not do this. Don't take, let's not go to court. What can I do to make this right? Let me humble myself. Brother, we need to be at peace. Remember the gospel. I'm so sorry. I, I want to make this right. I want to be reconciled. I want to be at peace with you. Um, do it before you go to court. Because once he goes to court and he starts the lawsuit, it's not going to get better. And then can you go to the verse? Did I put the verse in the slides? Oh, it's not in there. Uh, so he says, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. You think the person who's angry at you would be happy? You're like, oh good, he's in prison. He's been there. He got a 10-year sentence for this thing. Maybe he framed you. But he's like, oh, you know what? I should, uh, I should show him mercy. I should, uh, I should, the guy who's mad at you isn't going to all of a sudden become merciful. Anger doesn't do that. Anger festers and you try to extract every last bit of justice when anger sits in the heart. Don't you let anger sit in your heart. And when you see that somebody's anger against you, go on a rescue mission. Be reconciled. Because if you don't, uh, this bitterness in them gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If they could murder you, they probably would. And if they can turn you over to the judge, to the court, sue you, they will. And Jesus says, truly I say to you, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny. Because the angry person doesn't show mercy. When you're angry, what's missing? Mercy. If somebody's angry at you, what's missing? Mercy. But what characterizes Christians? Mercy. Mercy and love. So Jesus here, and he's going to do this all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. We're wrapping up. Jesus gets to the heart. He doesn't say, don't be angry merely. He certainly doesn't say, don't murder merely. Right? Jesus isn't dealing with these external things. He points out, he, he preaches, teaches in such a way that reveals our hearts. None of us can stand before this and say, Oh, yeah, I think I'm okay. I think this verse doesn't touch me. I, this verse condemns me. I've had to, there's been a lot of confession and actually a lot of peace seeking in me as a result of this verse. I, I pray that that's okay with you. No, that's the case with you. Nobody should sit here and read this and be like, I'm all right. Um, every single one of you has the capacity for anger might even have broken relationships right now. Don't be angry. God's children aren't angry. Don't be okay with somebody else being angry at you. God's children seek reconciliation. And don't let anger simmer. Godless discord has consequences, both temporal and eternal. You and I cannot get here. We can't get to this don't be. We can't meet this by just trying harder. Right? You can't look at this and say, man, I need to try a lot harder. I need to do better. If that's your answer, you do need to do better. I need to do better. But the answer here isn't, I need to double down my efforts at, at not being angry and loving my neighbor better. The goal is love. 
And we're going to love each other in this way. The only way that we could love each other in this merciful way is if we consider deeply the love and mercy that Jesus offers us. It started with the gospel, it comes back to the gospel. If you have been saved, if God has changed your heart and made you love others when he forgave you and gave you Jesus' righteousness, you will love others from your heart. And if you've not been saved, you cannot possibly love like Jesus calls you to. So what 1 John 4, 7 says, if we love God, we will love others. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And listen to this. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And if anyone who does not, anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is is love. This verse just this passage that we just read raises the bar of love. Not being angry isn't merely the goal, but go above it and say, I need to love my neighbor as myself. And we don't love in order to earn God's love, but we love because God first loved us. You know how I told you at the beginning, I'm going to give you a question to know whether or not you believe the gospel. Whether or not your sin still abides on you. You can't get rid of your sin by loving really hard, saying, God, see how much I love my brother. Will you forgive me now? But if you believe in this gospel message that God, while you were his enemy, took all your sins on placed them on Jesus, punished them there, and gave you mercy. If you truly believe that, it will be shown through the way you love your neighbor. And if you don't love your neighbor, that says something very clear about whether you believe the gospel. That's 1 John 4, 19 through 21. I want you guys to, either in your discussion groups or at home with your parents, consider these passages from 1 John in light of, in light of uh, what we just heard from Jesus. I'm going to read 1 John 4, 19 through 21. Listen carefully, and then we'll go to your groups. It says, We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. Did you hear that? If you say, I love God, but you hate your brother. If you say, I love God, and you're okay to be angry with your brother, you're a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he <clears throat> has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God, must also love his brother. Let's pray and we'll go to our groups. God, I pray that this love would characterize every single person in this room. God, we have all heard the gospel. And you have the power to change hearts. You can shine lights in, into our hearts to, to remove the veil, to remove our rebellion. And you can make us love you. God, grant faith even today. And then let us be marked. Because of your love for us, let us be marked by true love for one another that will not tolerate anger, that repents from anger quickly. That as far as it depends on us, seeks reconciliation. God, I pray. God, I pray in our discussion groups that you would help us, that you would make us be honest. Help us know when to speak, when to listen, that we wouldn't try to save face and sound good, but uh, that, that we would be honest with one another, that we would love one another in the way that we listen, the way that we speak, and that your word uh, 
your word would, would be our source of truth in these discussion groups. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.